So I'll just make a start, and what I want to do this, uh, this morning, um, so I, I, I love, we're such a visual generation, you know, um, whether that's social media, whether that's billboard signage, YouTube, whatever it is, we're such a visual generation. And so for me personally, I want to share some of my story around that, and, and that's why I use visual aids. So this morning what I want to do is I want to, I want to break it down into, is it moving, is it? It's working. Fantastic. Uh, basically, what I want to do is I want to go through, I want to tell, just to put you all at ease, uh, we're going to talk through a personal story, they're going to share some things that helped me on that journey, then I'm going to give you some great scriptures at the end, okay? So if you kind of want to know where are we going today, it's in this series called Free People. There we go. Okay, I thought I'd introduce myself, Matt Gregory from, um, I'll get the obvious out of the way. I've got to double apologise because, first of all, I'm from Auckland. Let's get the elephant out of the room. I preach in some locations like, oh, District 09, hey? I'm like, what? Is, what? Yeah, from Auckland, okay, sorry, sorry. And the next problem is I'm originally from Australia. Oh my goodness, it gets worse. I had no control where I was born, I'm so sorry, so sorry, but New Zealand is spectacular. Topol's incredibly stunning. And uh, just love being here. So this is a picture. I want to quickly tell you about my family. It's my beautiful wife in the, uh, with the, the shortest one. And uh, she's in apologies this morning. We're selling our home. We got open homes yesterday and today. And it's just one of those things where you've got to have the house clean and out the door. And so she's apologies. That's my middle daughter who's next. And that's her husband, Joel. And then I've got and my eldest daughter and her husband, Tim. They're currently in London at the moment. So I've got two girls who married two Kiwi boys. And this is my son just talking to a random guy, and, uh, and he's uh, about to turn 21 in a couple of weeks. And so we're in a series called um, Free People, and there's this great scripture from Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It's for freedom's sake. Uh, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Sorry, my apologies. And so here we go. I want to read a quote from Chris Belton. If you don't know who Chris is, he's from Bethel Church, Bill Johnson. He's written a great book, and you can read this. He has this quote, and I, I just want to provoke us with this quote. Just says this, I'm baffled by the fact that the greatest thinkers in the world are often godless, humanistic, self-centered, self-absorbed atheists. Comes out with a punchline, doesn't he? And uh, he says, it troubles me that many who claim they are Christians living, are living with limited, powerless, finite thinking. How is that even possible? How do people who claim to have the creator of the universe living on the inside of them, the mind of Christ thinking through them and the spirit of God influencing the world around them, even have the nerve to think small? Probably could just drop the mic right there. That's a provoking question. Like, and, and so this morning, I naturally want to talk into mindsets. So I want to talk into mindsets. And, and I, as I share my story, my preaching story this morning, it's not so much about, oh, that's great, that's a preaching story, you're a pastor, you preach. I, I hope the story, in some way, you can relate to it. And I hope in some way that, that everybody in the room will go, oh, yeah, something similar to happened to me, and, and this is what happened in my life. And you'll have your story. So first of all, I want to go back to when I was 20, and this is what I look like. And uh, long before filters were things you put on photos, that's what a photo looked like. And, uh, and so this is Kelly and I, we were the ripe old age of 20. And I got, to, I got asked, uh, we'd just moved to a, a small country, a country town called Bendigo. And I, I was in the Christian Bible Crusade Church then, it was a Pentecostal church. And I got asked to preach as a 20 year old. First time ever, come preach in the 5 p.m. service. It was, um, it was pretty cool. And naturally, what do I want to preach on? Well, I'm going to preach on the Holy Spirit. I'm going to preach on the Holy Spirit. We're a Pentecostal church. I'm going to preach on the Holy Spirit in you. And one of the things I, I focused on was one of the things, if you've got the Holy Spirit in you, is just the Holy Spirit actually wants to move through boldness. There's things you'll find yourself saying and doing. You go, well, that's God. That's the Holy Spirit. Anyway, so I preach on the 20 years old, uh, pretty green behind the ears, let's be honest, but just preach scripture, 
and just preach, come on, the Holy Spirit wants to give you boldness. And then lo and behold, now I've had to re, um, um, this is me reenacting some photos here. I actually don't have photos of the first service, so there's real photos and fake photos working through this presentation, okay. So let's pretend that's me preaching. And then, that's not me now, that's not me. Then what happens, at the end of my message, one of the elders in the church beelines for me. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it was, it was a little bit like this look. And I'm 20, just felt like I just preached my first sermon to the world, you know, got it all out there and felt like, man, God was in this. And then I get bailed up by the end of, at the end of the service and was really uh, shot down for all the things that were wrong with my message. Wow. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. First guy, first time having a go and you get, you get that. And, and, and he had a crack at me about the Holy Spirit and a crack at me. I'm like, I thought we were a Pentecostal <laughs> church, you know? Like, and, um, and it really took me back. And my natural reaction, which is what happened, was, well, if that's what, if that's what happens every time you preach, I don't even want to do this again. And, and literally, I didn't preach again in that church. I, I was just like, oh, thanks, but no thanks. Like, man, that's like, if that's what it is, this is brutal. This is brutal to get up here and share, and then just to get the email or the bail up at the end of the message. And, and you're like, oh, I thought I was just hearing from God. And, and I was. And, and so what I didn't know was, uh, over 10 years later, someone actually... Uh, I actually learned something. So I actually learned that what happened was, uh, even though he was an elder in the church, he'd never been baptized with the Holy Spirit. And this is the backstory, okay? I didn't know this at 20. So the backstory is he thought I'd been set up by the pastor to preach directly at him about being filled with the Holy Spirit and being baptized in the Holy Spirit and being powered by the Holy Spirit. Now I'm just obedient to God. As a 20 year old, no idea of that history. Pastor never told me anything. I didn't even know that was his story. And that was what the motivation was for having a go at me. Because he thought I'd been set up to preach at him. Now, God, I just want to say, if you think you've been set up this morning, I don't know anything about any of them. <laughs> Maybe a little bit about Neville, but otherwise, I've got no idea. And Teddy and Carl, but no one else about anybody else. So if it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you, let the Holy Spirit speak to you, okay? All right, we've got to quickly move through this. So I didn't preach again in that church. Then a few years later, I was in another church, which was the Acts or the Apostolic Church in Bendigo. And that's where I then, would then ended up being on staff for 10 years. And that's kind of a link of how I ended up here in New Zealand was through the movement in Australia to New Zealand. And, uh, and then what happened was we'd run these services on a Friday night. We'd run Friday night church, Sunday morning church. And uh, I got asked to preach. And this is a, a number of years have gone by. I'm pretty hesitant. You've got to understand I got pretty burnt the first time. And so then I preach. And, and what would happen was I would preach out of uh, um, insecurity. But I mean, my mindset is, man, if anyone, every time I preach, I feel like someone's ready to attack me. Immediately. So my mindset was, I'm going to over-research, I'm going to have dozens and dozens of scriptures so that I'm ready to go. And, and you, want to, you want to attack me on theology? Now I've got theology for you. And I've since studied theology, uh, uh, like qualifications and stuff, because I love it, but not for the purpose of defending my message. Anyway, so what happened was I, I would preach on a Friday night, and, that, and I picked up a few more times, oh, this is good. And then one of the guys, uh, an elder of the church, at uh, that church goes, man, one day you're going to be an amazing revival preacher. You're going to be a revival. Like the messages I was preaching at the time were, were just obviously landing and hitting hearts, and, and that's, that's one of Billy Graham's revival crusades, by the way. That's a real photo. That's not photoshopped. That's a real revival crusade, Billy Graham. And, um, and so, you know, you start seeing a young guy, I'm in my 20s, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And then a bit of ego kicks in, a bit of pride kicks in. You know, you get a little bit too confident. So what happened was our senior pastor at the time thought, oh, I can go on a holiday overseas. I'll leave it to the young guys to run the church while I'm away. I preach one Friday night. And by this time, I've got a little bit too cocky. Too little overconfident. 
And I, on a Friday night service, I do this message and I decide I want to be a funny preacher. Yeah, I'm like, I love comedy preachers who like, have you laughing the whole time and then right at the end give you a punchline and smack you between the eyes. Yeah, and I'm like, that's what I want to be. And so I preached and I preached and I cracked a joke. And this is really terrible. This is confession time. No, and you'll probably think lower of me, but that's okay. Confident who I am in God. Uh, what happened was, I crack a joke and it has a swear word in it, and I don't even swear. Yeah, that's the weird part, right? That's the bizarre part when you get too arrogant, too prideful, is that you, you cross a line. And then, and then literally you could hear the air suck out of the room. And I still had 20 more minutes to go. <laughs> So I'm like trying to backpedal this message. You know? like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And it, the message obviously fell very flat. Yeah. Didn't land. And naturally, I knew I missed the mark. Now, this is the irony, right? The production team thought it was the best message ever. <laughs> Never before in the history of the church in Bendigo had the podcast gone up so fast. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. Any other week, you'd be chasing it a week later going, hey, when's the podcast going to go? When's the... This one went up within minutes of the service ending. The senior pastor happens to have a stopover in Singapore. And what does he decide? I wonder if the podcast is up. So he, oh my goodness, the podcast's up. So he listens and hears me dropping this terrible joke, inappropriate language, everything. Oh my goodness, comes the phone calls from Singapore. Now, I already know I'd tented, I already knew I'd missed the mark, I already know I'd crossed the line, I already felt God dealing with me. And, and if you know me, I cry a lot, I cry, I cry. And then, true story, the next morning, I, back in the old days of church phone directories, and uh, before the privacy laws kicked in in Australia and I couldn't have them, and, and I literally tried to remember about 200 people that I could in that service, and at true to my, you can check with my wife, I literally called as many of those people as I could and apologised. Because I knew I'd gone, I, I, I knew the arrogance and pride had risen. And it wasn't, this is the house of God. Anyway, so, so then what happens? Uh, I don't want to preach. Please take me off. Well, actually, I didn't even have to ask to come off the roster. I just came off the roster. <laughs> Problem kind of sorted itself out. So then I didn't really preach. I preached occasionally, very rarely after that. And then what happened was, uh, fast forward, is, I've, I've tried to stick to, to well, fast forward a lot of stuff now. So fast forward, I then um, end up relocating here to New Zealand in 2013 and become the lead pastor now. My default is, is, um, is, is the worship team. So, you know, after I don't preach so much anymore, I'm, I'm back, in, back in the worship team. And, and then I become the campus pastor of Equipers North Shore, uh, or, or actually I move over to, to bring two ex churches together to launch Equipers North Shore, and then I literally go from playing guitar multiple times a weekend to suddenly having to preach every weekend. Yeah. This is my worst nightmare. You know, because by now I don't even trust myself. Do you know? Like I, I've gone from the journey of, well, when you preach, people just want to have a crack at you, yeah. to then when I preach. Oh my goodness, when is it God and when is it Matt? Because Matt I don't trust. God I trust. But in my own humanity, I don't trust me. And so then I'm like, I don't want to do anything. And then all of a sudden Sam's like, no, no, you're the new guy. You've got to be up all the time. And I was like, uh, I had to deal with a lot of things. So the problem was, you've got to remember, all my, my, my mindset around preaching was just so riddled with insecurities. And this is a true photo, of, this is a real photo of me sermon prepping. That's literally how I would sermon prep. Multiple translations, multiple everything. If I had one scripture, I had 20,000 scriptures every Sunday. And, and, and I would just trawl people through that every week. All based out of my own insecurity, all around my mindset around preaching. So then, uh, as a communicator, uh, you should ask my wife, it would be like preaching in the past was like, you might as well... It sounds terrible, but I'd be like, um, I was going to say, you might as well shoot me. But that's not a great example. I was just going to say, you know, like it's extracting teeth. You know, like painful. 
Let's go with painful. That's a great word to use. And I would just wrestle because I felt the weight of the word of God. This is God's house, God's word. And then I felt the need of people. Like, man, we just we all just need Jesus. And then I felt all these insecurities around when I preach and, and all my baggage that came with it. And so what I would do is when I first started preaching every Sunday, I would be up here with my pulpit and I'd have a, literally a minimum of 12 plus 8, 4 pages and I would just read. 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 Apologies to these guys who <laughs> had to live through that season. And I was just so, you know, if I moved this much from the pulpit, I was like, whoa, back, let's get back, let's stick to the script. And then I was like, it's not really engaging, you know, when all you do is look at notes and read notes. And then I moved to an iPad, but I still was trawling everybody through all my research. And so every Sunday it'd be me preaching a message, preaching a message, scrolling, preaching a message, preaching, and, and I was just, and then, and then I was trying to like, man, that's not really working with the people. I appreciated everyone who came. And then I went to, to um, I'm quite a creative person by nature as well. I went to these huge A3 notepads. And I would have it on the pulpit at the side because I didn't want to be seen lugging up my big A3 notepad to get on stage to preach the word of God. And the music team every now and then thought it'd be funny to flip the message and, and just to call me out. So then I'd be like, that's the wrong message. And then I'd be like turning pages on the stage. And it was quite like, oh my goodness, what are you doing? And then, and then um, I've written musicals and scripts and I'm quite theatrical by nature. And so then I went to props and this is a photo of someone's Facebook poster of me and a prop and I don't know why I'm preaching in a rubber dinghy but I'm in a rubber dinghy preaching a great message by now and uh, just probably losing the plot around preaching and then a good friend good friend many of you might know Pastor Mark Stevenson who literally is my back door neighbor of my fence now and um, Mark and I have had a great relationship for ages and Mark was in the campus at the time and and I can't remember whether I reached out to Mark or Mark most likely would have reached out to me going, Matt, can we have a coffee? Oh, please, somebody help me. You know, I'm just stuck in my mindset around preaching and I don't know how to get out of this. So Mark would go, Matt, you're literally taking people through a four-week series every Sunday. But can I help? Please, please. And I'd bring my big A3 notepads and can you go cross this out, cross this out? This one thing, just do that this Sunday. And, and began to help help shape me, help mentor me, help all those things. And then came the crazy thing on this journey where, to, I think it was off the back of one of the Acts conferences actually, and just felt the Holy Spirit nudge me to go, I want you to preach without notes. Now, do you remember my background? My background is to over research, to troll you through a four week series every Sunday. Sorry, God, like what? <laughs> Just trust what I've done in your life. Trust the Holy Spirit in you. Yeah. Trust that I'll move through you. And by nature, I'm a visual person. So this, then suddenly I started to preach like this and was like, oh, wow, I found my voice. You know, the danger with our mindsets is you look at other people and go, well, if that's the key to success, then I've got to be like that. But God has uniquely given all of us our own unique DNA, our own unique fingerprint. So while one thing we're about the body of faith, there's still an element of a uniqueness to all of us that you've got your, just your, your nuances of how God wants you to be you. He doesn't need, and that was the problem when I was a preacher. I would look at all these, um, like Stephen Furtick's probably one of the greatest preachers on the planet. And I got to the point where I couldn't listen to any of his podcasts because I was just like, I'm not preaching. Let's just play Stephen Furtick to the church. You know, like, like just so insecure around so many things. And... And then God just had to take on that journey. No, Matt, come on, you be the best version that I've made you. And so uh, I just want to pick up on some scriptures here. So Proverbs 23, verse 7, so as, a, as he thinks, or as a person thinks in their heart, so, they, so he is or so they are. And so there's this great proverb that talks about it. So really, how you think in your heart. So what are you thinking in your heart? Now, for me, I'm just sharing my preaching story. I've got a thousand one mindset stories, but I just could share this one because it's kind of a funny one. You can just laugh at me if you envy. And, um, and so, like, what do you think? Like, what do you think about yourself? Um, what, here's a good thing about, you know, when we say, as you think in your heart, we actually think with pictures. 
Like, like it says there on the screen. When I say the word dog, what do you think about? I instantly think about my mate. This is Huey. Huey's desperately missing me. He was pretty depressed when he saw the suitcase roll out and me walk out the, out the, out the garage. And, and so when, if you said to me, oh, talk about a, you were talking about your dog, I'm instantly thinking about my dog. Because we think with pictures. As soon as I mention something, you'll be like, oh yeah, I've got a, a mental image of that. And that's how we think. So we, we, we do, we tend to think with pictures. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So you're thinking about pictures. So every time, oh Matt, do you reckon you could preach? I like, Ugh. you know, like, it, it throws up pictures of either two things. One, being attacked at the end of the service, or me becoming so prideful and arrogant that God's like, here we go. <laughs> and, 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 and so you, you tend to think in pictures. Just on that passage, the original Hebrew, when you want to pull it apart, it just says the word for that phrase talks about the limitations and the boundaries of your heart. If we were to sort of use that Hebrew language and rephrase it, because English doesn't always do a great job of translating Hebrew and Greek. And it would kind of read more like this. It would say, above all else, guard your heart for it determines the limitations and the boundaries of your heart. So we do things in life that protect our heart. You know, we don't like to be hurt. We don't like to be taken for granted. We don't like to be abused. But at the same time, we also put our own limitations on our heart. Oh, I could never do that. Oh, that's not me. Oh, please, but thank you. Thanks, but no thanks. When all along, God has given you gifts and talents and wants to use them in different ways. The greatest thing we can do is really transform our communities on Mondays. So what's in your hand? What's in you? What's God put into you that he could use you powerfully? Yeah. One of our things is we believe ministry in the hands of every believer. Ministry isn't just what we do here on a Sunday. Ministry is what we do in our schools, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our businesses. When we're studying, it's ministries everywhere. So what limitations are you putting on that? So how do you see yourself? What's the picture that you hold of you? And that's different things for different people. For some people, body images is a real, is a real challenge because you see yourself a certain way. Uh, for other people, you kind of go, well, for ages, I struggle with, because I'm, I'm the youngest of six kids from a small country town in Australia, and somehow I ended up being here in New Zealand doing what I'm doing. But I wrestled sometimes with that, yeah, but I'm just this country kid. I don't have the MBA degree. I don't, and yet God still goes, no, I can use you. God's looking for willing people. But you've got to change the picture you see of yourself. So do you see, do you, when you look at yourself, do you think you've got a bright future? Do you actually think, oh no, I'm hopeful for tomorrow? Or do you actually see and you look at yourself and go, I finally knew what I've done. I finally knew who, where I've been. I, um, as a pastor, we sit with people all the time, and you know, I've got one guy who made a mistake 12 months ago, and he just can't move forward because in his mind, he's created this mindset that that defines him now. That one mistake doesn't define you. That's the beauty of the cross. When, when we, you know, when we say, "God, forgive me," you only have to pray the prayer once. God goes, "Forgiven." And it's our own mindsets that keep going back to God every day, a thousand times over. Oh, God, forgive me for that. Forgive me for that. I reckon God sometimes goes, really? We're doing this again? Can we, like, find something else to talk about? Anyway, Ephesians chapter 20. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. There is no chapter 20 in Ephesians, by the way. Uh, so now, glory to God, who's able through his mighty power to work within us to accomplish infinitely more. So God wants to do infinitely more in you and through you than you could even dream or imagine. In fact, the New King James puts it like he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or think. That's like mind-blowing. God wants to do stuff in you and through you that's even beyond your imagination. That's pretty cool. That's a great scripture. Uh, so how do we change the picture? So talk about mindsets, and there's like, you know, we really could make this a four-part series, and talk about how do you change mindsets. I, I want to give you some things about maybe, um, 
I, I want to talk about a few things. So quickly, I want to go through. First of all, you've got to get a new prophetic picture of your life. Yeah. So, you know, where you see yourself um, limited, where you see yourself restricted, where you go, hey, look, I tried that, I made a mess of it, I blew it. No, come on, get a new prophetic picture in here. So, for years, I, I could have just gone, hey, thanks, but no thanks. Pastor Carl, Matt, do you want to come preach? You'd rather not, actually, because you, you don't know what I've done. You know, I've got to get a new prophetic picture and go, no, actually, I'm excited to be in Taupe for. I'm excited to see the church. I'm excited to see what God wants to do in the room. And you've got to change that picture. Um, the other part is the secret is Christ in me, not a different set of circumstances. Just let that register for a moment. The answer, the secret is Christ in you, not a different set of circumstances. What do you mean? Well, maybe it's, it'll be different if I move to another town. It'll be different if I get a different job. Well, this church is rubbish. I'll go to another church. You know, no, it's a great church here. But you know, man, we think certain things, right? Because we're talking about we want to. Ch we think changing the circumstances changes it. It won't. Wherever you know the, wherever you go, you go. Did you know that? I've changed countries and I found myself. This. Oh my goodness, I'm here again. <laughs> You can change countries, but unless you change your mindset, the same you goes wherever you go. The same problems follow you. So the answer is Christ in you. How does God want to form Christ in you? How are you becoming more like Jesus? How are you transforming from glory to glory? In other words, how, God's not looking for perfection, but he's looking for progress. How are you progressing? It's a great uh, quote by Paul Scanlon, and he says it's not your job, your role, your boss, your location, your education, your money, your gender, your colour, your connections, age, experience, skills, opportunities of living for you. He says your heart. Because it's, it's the picture you see in your heart. And that comes from the mindsets that you form. Uh, I love, this is a great thought. You know, change your self-talk and you'll change your world. Romans 12, don't be conformed to the patterns we will be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God wants to renew your mind. Renews it through scripture. Renews it through times of prayer. Renews your mind in worship moments. I felt really provoked and we had um, an awesome global prayer night the other week on the North Shore and just felt the Holy Spirit challenge me. My mind set on a few things. But why not pray me? And that's really cool. Well, this is a great photo. This is me in my 30s. And um, I used to, um, used to do some boxing and um, some CrossFit stuff. Now, what happened was then I moved to New Zealand and then for a couple of years I didn't go to a gym. So a couple of years of not going to a gym and a couple of years of not doing any physical exercise, Matt, Matt was starting to put on a few kgs and starting not to be the Matt he really wanted to be. And I remember um, going to a gym for the first time in, in Auckland and they give you a personal trainer session for the first time you go. And, and, and so the trainer then puts me through this route, like, just want to see where you're at. And, and the first half of the thing, the first half of the workout with this trainer, I just was apologizing the whole time. I'm so sorry. I used to be better than this. Ugh. I was dramatized. But you know, like, and I'd be like trying to box and I'd be trying to, okay, drop and give me some put press ups and I'd be like, Oh, yeah, you know, and the whole time I'm like, I'm just apologizing to the trainer. So sorry, I used to be better than this. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. He goes, halfway through, he goes, you know what? Have a break for a few minutes, catch a breath, have a drink. I have a drink at the water fountain. I just felt that, man, your self talk is actually making you perform worse than actually really where you are. Yeah, you're not 100% fit like you used to be, but you're actually not this bad. And you know, so then um, I start the whole self-talk prep talk. Have you ever found yourself doing that? Now, my name's Matt. People call me Matt. But my, inner lot of, my internal monologue's always like, Come on, Matty, you got this! Come on, Matty, get up, get up! You know, I call myself Matty. No one calls me Matty except for my inner monologue that wants to coach me. And 
I just felt challenged and I go back and then the second half was like night and day to the first half, all because I was changed my self-talk. And I kept encouraging myself, no, no, come on, you got one more rep in you, you got this, you got this, you got this. And the difference was crazy. Um, so ways I've learned to change some mindsets, I've got to rapid fire you through this. Um, and so, first of all is, get a great community. Get a great group of friends. Get, get an e-group, get in a small group, get with a great group of people. This is me and a couple of the crew from the North Shore. We did whitewater rafting in Rotorua, one of the best days of my life, uh, along with getting married and having kids. Anyway, so it was just a great, it's a great day. And, um, but community, like these are guys are great to do life with. And it's not just, it's great, this group of people, man, we share life when it's on a mountaintop and we share life when it's in a valley. Get yourself around a great community. This is a great friend, Terry. Terry's been a mentor in my life. For, I couldn't tell you how many decades. Get a great mentor. In fact, I just have one, have multiple. I actually think different people bring different things. And when I got stuck in finance, I reached out to a friend who was just, man, amazing with finance. And it's really, really vulnerable to lay all your finance out on the table with somebody. Here's all my debts, here's all my, what I owe. Okay, anything else? Yep, you know, <laughs> you know when you get a great mentor, you like you got to just be vulnerable. But it's because they want to bring out the best in you. You know the crazy thing with Terry, he would always say, "Man, I just get so much out of when you and I catch up." I'm like, "What do you mean? I'm the one getting so much out of this." And that's a great relationship. It's actually two way. Um, anyway, he, anyway, that's us in Australia. Um, you know, mental. Um, so much of our mindsets is linked to our spirituality, and so much of our spirituality, it, it all flows. You know, God, we, we want to praise God with our whole body, right? Our mind, our soul, our spirit. So, exercise for me, I'm not advocating you've all got to suddenly become at the gym. Uh, I don't have a gym membership since COVID, but I did buy a trip, I do run. Like I'm at that point where I can't run on the road anymore, I've got those creaky knees anymore, you know, right? So, but a bit of rebound on a trivial works wonders. But yeah, this is the Nike app is a free app. If you didn't know this, it's like having a personal trainer. It's just so amazing. Get it on your phone, get it. And it's just like physical exercise actually helps my mental health. And if anyone struggles with mental health, I know you know this, but sleep, diet, and exercise are like the three critical things just to get going again. And and um and I start, you know, listen to some great podcasts. These two guys are just amazing in their leadership. If, if you are in any shape or form, in any form of leadership, man, listen to some of these guys, because they'll provoke your mindsets. They're gonna provoke you. These are two great um, pastors, Andy Stanley, Craig Michelle. Can't encourage you enough. Pastor Sam's also got a great podcast. <laughs> um, these are just some things I've learned. I, I love reading. Man, these two books, uh, both these great Christian authors, Bob Goff and um, Brian Zahn, you know, sinners and Bob Goff's everybody always is just such, I think everybody needs to read this book. It's just such a Jesus in action. It's just Jesus in action. And, and this book will provoke you to go, oh my goodness, actually, I could do a bit more for my community. And, and the other one, like, sinners in the hands of a loving God, from a theological, like it's such a challenge around, you know, we get hung up on, is God actually angry at me? No, look at Jesus. Come back to Jesus. And that's what I love about this book is God is holy, but Jesus, you want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. Jesus only got angry at the people who were, who were faking it. The, the religious who looked like they had it all together but just were so removed from the heart of God. Yeah. And Jesus just loved people. Yeah. Drew out the best in people. That's such a, two great reads. If you're in, um, these are not Christian authors, so I'm not advocating in that sense, but they, they actually pull through some biblical things in the books. These are just two great books that will provoke your mindsets around um, habits and around essentials. So just... Sometimes when worlds get noisy, we just got to declutter, you know, um, we, we got a house on the market 
and it's fascinating to declutter the house. And uh, you know, do I really need this? Do I really need to keep this? And it's a really, really good thing. And then I'm in business and management and stuff, and, and this is another great guy, Donald Miller, Business Made Simple. These are all sort of things that provoke my mindset. So I'm sharing these because these are the practical tools. You know, I mean, it's one thing to give you a great principle, and then everyone walks along and goes, that was great, but how? I'm a very much believe Christianity is both incredibly spiritual and incredibly practical. And these are some of the, so business made simple, like, man, the stuff I've learned, things around negotiation, I've learned stuff around communicate, I've learned so much, it's been so helpful. And then a great friend recommended this to me called The Artist Way, and I think she might be a uh, great Catholic, um, Julie Cameron. And this is really about, um, recently I got stuck in a business situation, in a, in a particular board meeting. You know, and you can't always articulate, wow, why am I so fired up about this? And, and the helpful thing about this is like, and just how to just do a, get it out on paper. Grab a pen, grab some sheets of paper, and just let your heart kind of come out. And then you'd be surprised when you get to the end of it, let it sit for a few days and you go back and one is you'll probably go, whoa, 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 Matt, you're a bit like, settle. And other times you're like, ah, oh, right, the real issue is this. And just journaling, writing, just getting it out helps you so much. Um, this is an, uh, another hero of mine. This is my dad. Try not to look at the photo, because I will cry. So um, I get to see my dad next month in Australia. So, so dad's 91, still lives at home on his own. And what I want to provoke you around mindsets, dad was 80 when he first left the country on an aeroplane. Never left the country prior to 80. And his first trip was to come with me on a missions trip. So we went to Vanuatu, and we did missions in Vanuatu, and we have a, a great church over there. And that was Dad's introduction of overseas travel, was to go on missions at 80. And then uh, last year, so Dad, 90 last year, managed to raise through his church uh, a whole lot of funds to build a Christian school in the Middle East. So when I say, sometimes we sit there, like I'm, I'm, not, I'm neither young, I'm neither old, right? I'm in the middle somewhere. And, uh, but you know, we can still go, oh yeah, but that's kind of for the next generation. And God's like, it's still for you. I still got purpose for you. I still got mission in you. And there's more. So I want to provoke you. Dad's 91. If Dad is 91, can still be rolling money to build Christian schools in the Middle East. Uh, and he's on the he's on the pension. Uh, so you know you know he he's inspiration. Anyway, the Word of God. I'm going to rattle through a bunch of scriptures really quickly to wrap this up. Some great scriptures, so I just want to give you the word. This is the crucial thing around changing your mindsets. Uh, with God on my side, I am fearless and I'm afraid of no one and nothing. You got fear going on? Come back to the word of God. Proverbs 23, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. If you don't think you're incredible, just come circle back. What does God say about you? What does God think about you? Um... God is for us. Who could be against us? And regardless of the elder at the end of the meeting who wants to rattle my theology, you know, like God is actually for you. God is more for you than you are for you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Written by the guy who was in a prison cell. Just that's that. Paul's life blows my mind. The guy's in jail. And if and Pastor Carl ended up in jail next week, we'd all be like, sketchy, come on, what's he been up to? Something shady's going on. Oh, well, Pastor Carl, we don't know who he is. You know, but the Apostle Paul, from preaching the gospel, ends up in jail and writes, you know, pretty much most of the New Testament that we read. And God can use you in any situation. That's the key. If anybody knew how to overcome a mindset, it was Paul. Yeah. Um, and so he goes, and then, then in Deuteronomy, remember it's the Lord your God. He's the one who gives you power to be successful. Sometimes we think it's all about what we've done. And God goes, wow. <laughs> uh, Philippians 4 verse um, 
6 to 7. It says, don't be anxious about anything. In every situation, prayer, petition, thanksgiving, give your requests to God. Then the peace of God. Gee, we need the peace of God. How much does our world need the peace of God? I like this picture. It says, things are helped by worry. No, it's still blank. Okay. <coughs> and then uh, another scripture. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And then I just want to land on this up. The band wants to come jump on stage. This is such... The whole chapter of Ephesians 3 is just pure gold. If you get nothing from this message, just get this. Go home and read Ephesians chapter 3. And it just says this, I pray for His glorious unlimited resource. He'll empower you with inner strength through His Spirit. Christ makes His home in your heart. You can trust Him. Uh, you go down, roots grow down, and, your, and the love will grow strong. Get this, may the power to understand all that God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep is His love. We all want to break into the Bee Gees right now. How deep is your love? Anyway, so, just me, just me, sorry. Anyway, so um, may you experience the love of Christ. It's too great to fully understand. And you'll be made complete in the fullness that God has now. Glory to Him is able through His mighty power at work within us. I still love this. We accomplish infinitely more than we could ask or think. God wants to do so much more in you and through you. Why don't you all stand to your feet? Like, how is your mindset? How are your mindsets? I just want to create just a, a little moment just here. So if you can't do it, you can close your eyes. And... There's a real enemy, there's a real devil, who's out to steal, kill, and destroy. He's definitely out to steal, kill, and destroy your mind space, your head space, your thoughts. But I love that you can take every thought captive and you can bring it back to the cross. And you can bring it back to Jesus. And you can come back to go, no, what does God say about me? What does the Holy Spirit want to do in me and through me? Mindsets. Allow the Holy Spirit just to come, rest in your heart. And say, Holy Spirit, show me the pictures that I've held on to. That actually you want to exchange. Cross is the great exchange. My sin for forgiveness. My flaws for healing. My, my selfishness for an incredible relationship. God is so into exchanging. But He also wants to exchange the negative pictures that you've developed. The things that you've gone, oh, I don't think I could ever be there. I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to provoke you and change you. Mindsets, come on. Greater is Christ who is in you than the devil in the world. When you can do all things. The last thing I want to land on is just while you're allowing the Holy Spirit to bring to your attention mindsets,
where there's been hurt, I pray for forgiveness. Spirit wants to empower us. So Lord, we just open our hearts, God. Provoke us, challenges. Lord, that we will become more like you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm going to all look up. I'm going to head back to Pastor Carl. I just at the end of the service, you know, it'd be always great if you, if you feel like, oh, I really want to respond in some way. We'd love to pray for you. Stick around. I'm sure there'll be a bunch of other people who'd love to come and pray. We just want to help stand and pray. You know, sometimes you go, oh, I just need help. You know the story about the elder? And I'll just, I'll end on this and give it to Carl. Um, that elder and I actually over time became really good friends. In the middle of COVID, he developed a brain tumor. It's a really, really sad story. And he had a few surgeries and just was, you know, became inoperable. And I got a phone call to say um, he and actually another really close friend both had brain chips. It was a really bizarre scenario to have two people. And I just, in the middle of COVID, we had a window where somehow the international bubble opened up. I managed to, on a Sunday night, book a flight for a Monday morning, go back to Australia, visit my two friends, both in hospital. And, and one of those elders is one of them. And by then, he he was very deteriorated, but both men died within the next four weeks. And I was able to get in and I got back out right before Melbourne shut the border again. Like I was in and out for one week. It was just a miraculous scenario. I just got to see.